Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 15th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss how we believe the legislature should address the federal money coming to the state under the American Relief Plan. Second, we explain why we think the House Minority's Declaration of Guiding Principles abandons middle and lower income Alaska families. And third, we look back at some historical numbers to see if we can draw any guidance for making and sustaining deeper spending cuts. And now, Let's join Michael. First and foremost, we're going to tackle all this money floating around. $1.9 trillion. What does Alaska get out of this deal? What's it cost us in the long run, I think, is the question that nobody's asking. But let's talk about it. What does it get us in the long run? Brad Keithley, good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? You know, another day above ground. It's all paradise from here, my friend. <laughs> so uh, what, uh, what's going on? Well, the the the... Federal government passed the American Recovery Plan, uh, the ARP. That's the that's the name for this version of uh, of the CARES Act, um, and it's putting a lot of money into uh, into the hands of individuals and putting a lot of money into the hands of states. There was an article in the uh, Anchorage Daily News that said Alaska will get a massive injection of money from the COVID nineteen aid bill. Here's where it will go. It's a fairly decent outline of all of the pots of money that uh, that are coming in but but here's here's the thing I want it I want people to sort of focus on or I think people should focus on yes we're 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 getting a lot of money in but we've still got huge deficits uh in in our uh, in in our budgets uh I ran the numbers uh uh last night uh from the spring revenue forecast uh and looking at FY22 the upcoming fiscal year the year that the that uh, the budget year that uh, the legislature is working on now, even even taking into account uh, the the incremental revenues from higher oil prices that the state's now forecasting, we're still over a billion dollars uh, in deficit, even at Governor Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, reduced spending levels. And there's no guarantee those reduced spending levels are going to be adopted by the legislature. Over a billion dollars in deficit. So. So we've and 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 that continues. Uh, uh, that continues out through the remainder of the decade, as we've discussed before. So yes, there's a lot of there. There is going to be federal money coming into the state, uh, but it's not it's not this giant pot of money that everybody should think. Oh, I, I've had this project and now I can I can finally get this project funded. The money's going to be needed uh, to to fill the to fill the deficit. Right. There's there there's money going to the schools, uh, and that's great. But we should view that as offsetting, uh, not not as a not as a, a boondoggle, you know, pot of money that the schools can go spend on new things. We should view that as helping to offset uh, what the state would otherwise need to spend on the schools. There's money going to local government. Again, that's great, uh, and uh, and and local government needs the aid. But we should we shouldn't view that as an extra pot of money. It should offset. What uh, what the state otherwise would need to fund local government, and there's money coming to state government, and again, that's great, but we shouldn't view that as um, as as extra money uh, for people to you know slice and dice and, and put on their own pet projects. It's going to be needed to uh, 
to, to fill the, the state's revenue uh, hole. There's money going to individuals, uh, and that's the $1,400 checks, and that's great. Uh, but frankly, we should view that as sort of the state, as sort of the federal government taking care of the PFD, uh, uh, the, at least the supplemental PFD uh, that Governor Dunleavy has proposed for this year. In, in short, in short, the state's got huge deficits, uh, and we ought to view this as we ought to view this money coming in as helping to fill those deficits, um, it, it, and and not view it as as extra. Uh, uh, something that uh, something that uh, that we go get to, to spend someplace else. Businesses are going to be helped. Uh, there is money coming in. Uh, the the PPP program is being extended. There's money that's targeted toward restaurants. Uh, there's money that's targeted toward uh, toward other things. There's money targeted toward uh, the university. There's money targeted toward K through 12 schools. All of that's great. But when you look when you look at it from you know from ten, the 10,000 foot level. We've got huge deficits against what what the statutes say we ought to be funding right now, uh, and we ought to view this money that's coming in uh, as a way of filling those deficits, as opposed to uh, creating an excess that uh, or creating a pot of money that uh, that we ought to be going out and uh, and thinking that we can uh, spend on this program or that. So your contention is that this is more of a triage. This gives us a chance to stem the flow long enough to get our house in order. So that we can, uh, so that we can bring our spending back on track and uh, and have something sustainable, because this is a one-time deal. I mean, we hope it's a one-time deal, because if it's not, we're I mean, we're already adding you know billions and trillions of dollars to the national deficit. Uh, but I mean, we should expect that this is a one-time deal, and it gives us just enough opportunity to get our ducks in a row. I think I think that's great. I, the way I've talked about it uh, in the past is a, or in the past week is a bridge. It, it gives us a bridge from where we are uh, uh, to where we're going to be. None of this, none of this takes away uh, the deficits we're running in future years. None of this takes away from uh, from the need to develop revenue sources, uh, or, or or you know, for those who still believe in cuts only, uh, cutting down to uh, to long term uh, uh, traditional revenue levels. None of this doesn't solve that long term problem. It doesn't. It doesn't begin to solve that long term. What it really does is say, okay, we, we can really stop thinking about rating uh, the ERA. We can stop thinking about overdraws uh, to to fill in uh, to fill in the budget gaps we've got in the near term. But we still need to be focused on uh, we still need to be focused on developing long term revenue sources or you know achieving these long term cuts. Uh, uh, to balance the budget uh, over the long term, right. it's, it's a it's a bridge, and and we need to use it as a bridge. If you know, well. shame on us if we take any dollar of this and say, oh, we get to go, we go get to spend it. Well, like that. that's my fear, Brad. My fear is is that this will just be another excuse for the politicians that are currently in office. You know, the ones who are currently responsible for putting us in this position in the first place, that, that they'll just use it as an excuse to kick us down the you know kick this can down the road a little bit further oh we got bailed out we've got another year now to decide now we can go forward and you know do all i mean that, that's my fear i mean you know you and i have had this argument before that that you know anytime new revenues come in my fear is that they'll just spend it you know you, you're thinking that they're eventually going to have to you know realize the reality of you can't keep just doing that and expecting it to be okay but i mean here to four it's all worked out for him so maybe they'll just see this as one more opportunity to kick it down the road well, that would be I, I, that would that would lump this legislature. If this legislature did that, that would lump this legislature in with the the legislatures from the last ten years, and and a lot of these people ran on I'm different. I'm going to go in. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to solve this. Uh, if they do that, if they if they you know use this as a as a oh whew, you know we made it through one more time. We don't have to worry about it. If they do that, they're just as bad as the legislatures uh, for the last ten years. So maybe maybe that's where they end up. But uh, uh, from, from the standpoint of looking at where we are and looking at where we're headed, this is at best this this is a pothole filler. This isn't this isn't go out and build a new road. This is a pothole. You get to fill some potholes, um, but but next year you're going to have more potholes and and you don't have any more filler. You've got, you're going to have to go out and uh, and 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 fill those holes someplace else. So. Um, maybe they do, you know, maybe they do, uh, uh, 
say, oh, we, you know, the cavalry's come over the hill yet again. This time, the federal government, we don't need to worry about it. But that's, that, they're just making the same mistake the legislatures of the last 10 years have made. Right. Well, and I found it interesting how this article painted all the rosy pictures of all the money that's coming to us, but it doesn't dive down deep into all the other stuff that's in this bill. The restrictions on uh, being able to reduce any kind of state taxation or any kind of create special programs to offset taxes and everything else. You can't use any of the monies to contribute to your pension funds and everything else, although it also includes another $300 plus billion to bail out union pension funds. I mean, there's so many things wrong with this. I, I just don't even know where to begin. But uh, basing it on the state level, you're right. This is our one and done. This is our one shot to get it done. And maybe this legislature is different. Basically, number one is is we've got some money we can, we can use as a bridge uh, to get to where we're going. But we, we're still going the same place. We're still going to a future that has huge deficits under our current fiscal structure, and we need to address those somehow. And this bridge isn't going to – this bridge is going to fill potholes a little bit, uh, but it's not uh, It's not going to uh, – uh, it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't even solve the near-term problem. Right. There isn't enough money in this, frankly, to get back to uh, – back to a a, a full budget yeah. um, so it's uh, the, 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 the 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 problem I would have or the issue I have with the Anchorage Daily News article is it's a lot of good stuff we're getting all this money in but it doesn't have a paragraph that says but we still have these deficits uh, it's going to help fill a portion of these deficits uh, but we've, we're still facing a, a, a huge fiscal issue going forward. And, of course, my fear still remains the same, which is they'll see this as an opportunity to throw themselves a lifeline and kick this down the road yet another year. That's, again, that's, it's, it's a problem. Number two, which is the uh, new pronouncement from the st- minority, the Republican minority, which I found very interesting uh, because it comes in and talks about their new principles, but it leaves out a big, big issue on it. it go ahead it, it it does and and it's just it's shocking to me that it's just it's just not mentioned at all here's the paragraph that deals with uh, with fiscal issues we believe in governance that fits alaska we will fight for state government that operates transparent uh, operates transparently remains accountable to the people acts with integrity operates on a responsible budget that does not inhibit economic growth this includes preserving our permanent fund for future generations that's code word for don't uh, don't overdraw the PA, overdraw the the permanent fund, overdraw the perma- the earnings reserve, instituting a spending limit. Uh, that's code that's a code word for you know spending limits. But spending limit, as we've talked on the show before, spending limits don't uh, don't balance the budget. I mean, uh, it, we've got such a deficit that they don't that they don't come down to to actual revenue levels, and opposing a statewide income tax. The thing that's missing out of that sentence, this includes preserving our permanent fund for future generations, instituting a spending limit, and opposing a statewide income tax. The thing that's not in there is permanent fund dividend. There's nothing in there about protecting the permanent fund dividend. The, the latest code word in, in – or the latest set of code words in, uh, in Juno is a sustainable permanent fund dividend, that, we, that we're trying to get a sustainable – permanent fund dividend, which really means a, a, a dramatically reduced dividend, but one that sort of, you know, is, is you, you can sort of count on there being enough leftover money uh, to, uh, to develop the sustainable permanent fund dividend. There, that, that isn't even in this sentence. And, and what I really find troubling about this is, is the last phrase, opposing a statewide income tax. Well, we have an income tax. That's what permanent fund cuts are. They are an income tax that, that hit the middle and lower income Alaska families more. What they mean by, by a statewide income tax is a progressive income tax. So basically, basically what, what this Declaration of Principles is saying, we oppose an income tax that would reach the top 20 percent, that would hit the top 20 percent, uh, uh, like the one that, that we have now doesn't. We oppose a statewide income tax that would hit the top 20 percent, but we've got nothing to say about the existing statewide income tax that hits middle and lower income Alaska families. I think I think that gap, that failure to put the to include the PFD as part of their principles, even even sustainable uh, 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 permanent fund dividend. I think that failure to put that in the declaration of principles is is a huge, huge uh, issue. Now, 
individual Republican representatives are going to say, as Sarah Vance has said in an exchange I've had with her, oh, I still support the PFD. Well, that's great, but your caucus doesn't. And what's really important here is what is what the 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 19 or the 18 or whatever it is today uh, uh, Republicans think as a group what they're willing to stand up for as a group. I understand you, Sarah, one of 40 uh, are are still supporting the PFD, but your caucus isn't right. uh, is isn't talking about well, the PFD, and, and, and I think I think that's just a huge problem. Well, and I and I agree. I think that's I, I agree. I think that there are individual legislators out there who do support the PFD, but if they're not willing to, uh, you know, to stand up and and put it out there in writing, and by the way. It, it basically implicitly endorsing because they don't talk about defending the permanent fund dividend itself and because they again through they imply that you know that they don't want any other form of income tax uh they seem to be implying that they'd be okay if the permanent fund wasn't there and to increase that tax on the lower income you know on on lower middle and lower income Alaskans i mean that's that seems to be the the implication here and i think that is troubling i think you know that we voted a lot of those people in I know that I voted for my representative based on that and, and uh, you know, that I want to see the dividend taken off the table as an issue. I want people to be paid what they need and, and, you know, for these folks to stand up for it. And it's very disappointing to see that the dividend itself was not explicitly talked about in these, you know, this charter, this principal uh, uh, outlay. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's the title of it is a declaration of our guiding principles. Well, one of their guiding principles is not preserving the PFD. I mean, one of their guiding principles is opposing a statewide income tax, opposing a tax that would reach the top 20%, but it's not opposing the existing income tax that hits middle and lower income Alaska families families hardest. It's a, it's a, it's a disappointing uh, uh, document, frankly, from, uh, from, from the Republicans, the ones you would think of anybody there, the House Republicans, you would think they would be the ones – that would say yes, and we're going to stand for a permanent fund dividend. At least the the mealy mouth phrase "sustainable permanent fund dividend," but but you know it, it, it's it's glaring by by its absence. Right, right, glaring by omission. Look, uh, I'm I'm severely disappointed because I know legislators who are supportive of a full PFD of you know of wanting to pay back some of the PFD who want to stand for this. I know that there's some in there. And I feel like uh, I don't know if they got cajoled. I don't know if they got you know if they got railroaded or what. But the fact, or maybe they just missed it. Maybe they just missed the fact that the permanent fund dividend itself is not mentioned in these, you know, this this statement of principles. And uh, when I saw this and I read it and then I reread it and then you sent it to me and and I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm already into the hip deep in this thing. And I was just like, where is the you know where is the the fire? that these folks had, and again, I'm not pointing out individual legislators saying it's your fault. I'm just saying there were a lot of legislators who ran on a full PFD, and yet the the corporate talking points that come out of this group is all this other stuff except where's the PFD now? And, 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 and I'm just like, what's going on? Have they decided that they're just going to throw the PFD under the bus and deal with everything else, or or what's going on? I mean, like you said, Sarah says she's in favor of it. I know Kevin is. I know I know there's a half a dozen legislators that I could name right now. They're all in favor of a full PFD. What happened in this meeting that none of this stuff was mentioned? Yeah, and Michael, as I as I say, the thing that really bothers me is the statement "no income tax." Now I understand why they do that. I mean, I understand that they're. That they, that they that they don't like the concept of all of alternative revenues. They don't say in here, by the way. They don't say cutting you know spending down to uh, uh, traditional revenue uh, levels uh, supportable by traditional revenue levels. They don't say that either. Uh, but the but the no income tax. I mean, we have the, the the thing that if there's one thing that 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 we've talked about consistently on this show over the years is that we have an income tax. We've had an income tax for the last five years. You talk to middle and lower income Alaska families, they're feeling the, the effects of that income tax, the diversion of, of, of revenues otherwise going to the private sector into government. That's a tax. That's a tax on their income. And for them to say in here, no income tax, we already have an income tax, so they're talking about something else. What they're talking about is income tax that would reach the top 20%. For them to prioritize that, to prioritize the no income tax over 
you know, the PFDs, preserving PFDs, I think it's just, I think it's just a, a slap in the face to middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and, you know, it's, it's the Republicans. If anybody should be saying that about preserving the PFD, it should be the Republicans. And, and the fact they can't come together as a caucus, the 18 of them can't come together as a caucus uh, to put that as, as part of their principles uh, is just, is just hugely disappointing. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more uh, at this point. I mean, I, I want, uh, I mean, that's why a lot of these people got elected. I had to laugh. There was a piece by Jennifer Johnson in the uh, ADN, an opinion piece. And my first thought was, why would I care about what your opinion is? Because you 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 got voted out for that. But you know what? It's exactly the same kind of, uh, it's exactly the same kind of thing we're seeing in the business as usual uh, machinations of the Republican caucus right now. I mean, I'm, I, I, again, individually, I like all these people and I, and I usually stand with all these people, but corporately together, they're making a huge mistake here. I mean, I just, I see this and I see people, you know, getting upset and, and, you know, Hey, that's not what I voted for. Well, then contact your legislators and tell them, Hey, that's not what I voted for. Why won't you guys defend this? And maybe somebody out there wants to sound off and tell us why they they, they will defend it. But, uh, it, you know, again, just very disappointing to me. 20 seconds now, Brad. What you're going to get when, when you when you talk to individual leaders, legislators is going to – well, I got up from Sarah, which is, I support the PFD. Well, good. But you're one of 40. I was counting on, on you being a force in your caucus for the caucus to support the PFD. And it's just yep. it's just not there. Exactly. This third one, because this is going to be a deeper dive here. Um, last week, Brad and I talked a little bit about where cuts could go. Brad lined out like the top five – uh, you know, budget items and, you know, where the where the most return for the cuts could be sourced and everything else. And I asked him to to delve a little deeper and said, look, you know, l- let's go back not just four or five years. Let's go back to some of the leaner years, you know, when the, when the spending was at its lowest. And Brad was kind enough to uh, to take to take the effort on and, and shoulder his way in there and take a look at where we need to be for sustainability. Brad, you and I, seven years ago, were talking about a budget somewhere in the $4 billion range. Started out at 4.1, ended up at, I think, 3.8 or 3.9 is where the ICER model had put it. We never got anywhere near that, but uh, we're looking at it today, and now we have numbers and it's kind of surprising when you sent them to me. I was a little, I was a little surprised. Uh, I mean, I obviously haven't done the math, but I'm assuming that your math is correct on this. And as we look at this, there are some cuts available, but maybe not as deep as many people think. Yeah. So what I did was I went back in, and 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 uh, uh, Ledge Finance has has tools that make this uh, easier than it otherwise might be. I went back in and looked at. Uh, spending adjusted for uh, historical spending adjusted for uh, inflation and and population growth, and the way you do that is you 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 take you calculate real spending, which is spending adjusted for inflation, and then you divide it by the population in each, each year, and you get uh, you get per capita spending. So th- these numbers are. Um, spending per capita, which is adjusted for, uh, as I say, adjusted for inflation and, and population growth, um, and and it is uh, the, the the numbers are a little surprising. What I what I did, if you're showing the chart uh, that we did, and I posted it in the the the, the Common Core uh, uh, Facebook group uh, before we went on, uh, what I did was was look at the past uh, uh, 20 years. Well, actually, I looked all the way back to the beginning of time and. The beginning of, of statehood, and uh, the lowest level of spending ever was in '72, right before the first tranche of oil money hit uh, with the uh, with the Prudhoe uh, with the Prudhoe lease sale, um, and it stayed adjusted for inflation and population. It stayed uh, fairly high even through the the mid '80s. It stayed fairly high uh, into until we got in the in the early 2000s. And in the early 2000s, there was a period of time when uh, spending uh, came down significantly, and then it went back up again in 2006 when uh, when oil prices went up. But if you so, I so I took that period in the early 2000s and I compared it to the the last uh, uh, six years uh, that we've been through. And and for those looking at the chart, if you have the chart up, uh, you can see that uh, in 2004. Uh, fiscal year 2004 and 2005, uh, spending got down on a on a on a 
per capita basis, real per capita basis, uh, down to nearly five thousand uh, dollars uh, per person, forty five hundred dollars in uh, operating expenses, uh, ag agency operations, one hundred and fifty dollars per person in uh, per capita in uh, statewide operations, and three hundred thirty eight dollars per capita in uh, capital for a total of, of five thousand fourteen, and it and it stayed low for uh, another year. Uh, 2000 uh, fiscal year 2005 it was five thousand three hundred and forty five dollars uh, per capita that compares those two years compared compared to the the governor's proposed uh, FY 22 budget that comes in at about fifty six hundred dollars five thousand five hundred and ninety eight dollars uh, on a on a per capita basis uh, so the current spending is about five hundred dollars per capita higher than FY 2004. Uh, and about $200 per capita higher than FY 2005. Um, but you have to focus on the fact, you, you also need to take into account the fact that those two years, FY 2004 and 2005, are the lowest two years in the last 20. There's no other, there's no other uh, year uh, that, uh, that comes close to those. Um, and so while you can say, that, that current spending levels are still above those in 2004 and uh, 2005. Uh, the current spending levels are below uh, the level in any other year uh, uh, during, the, during the last 20 years. Um, what, what also triggered this was during their presentation to Senate Finance, the Ledge Finance Division, uh, Alexi Painter said, you know, maybe we've gotten, maybe, as he looked over the last three or four years, he said, maybe we've gotten state spending down to as low a level as we can achieve. But basically what he was saying, we've made cuts, cuts some places, but those have been offset by increases other places. As we talked last week, the university has been cut significantly, not, a, not as much as it could be in my opinion, but significantly, but that's been offset by increasing corrections. Uh, increased spending in corrections and in and in public safety, um, and and Alexi's conclusion out of that, Ledge Finance's conclusion out of that was, you know, maybe this is maybe this is sort of the the natural low. Well, it's not really. I mean, if you go back and look at 2004 and 2005, we got it lower than that on a on a on an inflation population adjusted basis. We got it lower those two years. Right. But but it's only it's only those two years that uh, that that we got it lower. And I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a hard pill for some people to swallow as you look at this. I mean, historically we can look back at raw numbers, but you've broken it down on a per capita UGF spending, which doesn't include uh, you know other specialty programs, doesn't include federal spending and everything else. But it does. It's just it's the base raw number on dollars spent out of the general fund on a per resident basis, just so that we know, so everybody knows what we're talking about. Here. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's what you're, it's what you're, it's what you look at when you're looking for deficits because DGF and they play, the legislature plays games with, and so does the administration play games with DGF, but by and large DGF designated general funds is just spending what you're bringing in federal funds. You're spending what you're bringing in the, 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 the gaps, the deficits uh, occur in UGF. So when you're looking at, you know, can we get spending down enough to close the gap, enough to close the deficits? You have to look at at, uh, at UGF. Bringing DGF spending down really doesn't help you. Bringing federal spending down really doesn't help you because because those are being driven by the revenues you're getting uh, for those specific programs. You'd have to bring UGF down. So that's why everybody, uh, uh, when they look at these, ultimately focus on uh, on UGF. So we're looking at roughly five hundred thousand or five hundred dollars. If we wanted to bring it down to historic lows, we're looking at a five hundred dollar reduction per person uh, on a per capita basis to match that lowest number back in two thousand four. Uh, we are talking about a savings of about three hundred and thirty million dollars, though overall. If that's if that's what you know, if that's what we're looking at. Yeah. It. Uh, yes. It would be. Uh, it would be. Uh, uh, it would be cuts, additional cuts, but but here's here's the other thing, Michael. You would have to sustain those cuts. I mean, it's not it's not just getting those cuts cuts accomplished in any given year. You have to sustain those cuts uh, over time. As we were talking in the earlier segment, we've got a billion. Even after you adjust for uh, uh, for increased oil prices, 
we've got we've got billion dollar deficits that we're facing uh, from now through the end of the decade and 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 beyond. So it's not just getting it's not just you know getting down five hundred dollars more per capita uh, and 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 saying okay mission accomplished. It is sustaining that. And the other thing the, the other thing this another you know if you built built this out over over a longer period of time. What this chart tells you is, yes, on any in a year, FY 2004, you can get it down, but but then it starts to build back, um, right. and and it's 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 hard. It, well, we've never seen a sustained period ever ever since statehood. Seen a sustained period uh, where we've uh, well since since '93 since we got the Prudhoe money. We've never seen a sustained period where we've kept it down. Um, and I think I think there's the, the, those are the those are both those factors you have to you have to focus on. One is right. can you can you get it down, and two once you get it down can you keep it down? And there's no period in our history that shows that we that we've kept it down. And historically, of course, on top of that, we still have the automatic increase in government, which is a hundred hundred and fifty million dollars a year anyway. On top of it, so I mean it all factors into uh, basically an overwhelming struggle to try and hold back the size and scope of government and it's it i mean this is the battle right here this is the this is what we can accomplish and this is the battle this is the hard truth of where we've been what we've done and those yearning for the good old days may realize that they're not quite as good as the you know the looking through the lens of, lens of nostalgia they're not quite as good as as they may have been 45 seconds here Brad I'll give you the final word well i, I it, all, it all comes down to a, a, a question of political will do we have the political will not only to get the spending down for another year, to get it down to these this historic level, uh, but to sustain it over the long period of time. And we just haven't shown that we have the political will. As a state, individual representatives will be able to say they, they, they vote that way, but, but we haven't shown that we have the political will as a state uh, to e- even get it down to that level, much less sustain it over. I mean, in a lot of ways, Brad, this is some dreary numbers because as we look at it, we're like, ow, ow, ow. This is not, again, I think we look at this back through the lens of nostalgia and think, oh, it would have been great if we had done that, but we're not. And and as much as John talks about we should start every budget at zero and then work and then cut you know work up, I mean it'd be great if we had zero based budgeting. It would be great if we could do that. And even like I said, even if we cut that five hundred dollars off per person on per capita spending, that's only three hundred and thirty million. And if we go back and we rejigger the the oil taxation and we get another three hundred million, that's only still only six hundred million, six hundred and fifty million. And yet we see the budget going up another hundred and fifty million automatically with. Pay increases and everything else. I mean, this is a this is a challenge. Yeah, what's what's going on, Michael? You know, it's a billion dollar deficit, and that's that's composed of two things. It's composed of 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 costs have increased, their spending has increased, but revenues have also dropped. We're not at the eighty, ninety, you know, uh, uh, hundred dollar uh, revenue. We're not at the when you look back in the early two thousands. We're not at the uh, million barrels a day or million two. Uh, barrels a day or million five barrels a day. We're just we're not at those revenue levels from uh, from oil anymore. And so and so you know when you talk about balancing the budget through spending cuts, you not only have to go back to, to achieve the 2004 uh, fiscal year 2004 spending spending levels and sustain that out over time. You have to do more than that. Because your revenues, uh, your your oil, the oil prices right. and the and the productions fell. Right, because we don't have the production to fill up that gap. That's the problem. We had money even back in '04. We had money, and we had you know million barrels a day coming in or whatever. And 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 now it's a fraction of that. So I mean, maybe five thousand dollars per person shouldn't be the goal. Maybe it should be forty five hundred. I mean that you know, but we don't know. We can't. We can't. Uh, uh, we we can't foresee what's going on, and there just does not seem to be the political will, as you and I have talked about, of cutting that. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, if four, if forty five hundred dollars is the goal, if that's what it would take, we've never done that, not since nineteen ninety three, on a on a on a inflation adjusted population adjusted basis, we've never done that uh, as a state. So you can't you can't point to a time and say all we need to do is go back to spending that we were doing. Uh, in that point in time, there, there's no point in time 
at to to which we can go back and say you know we 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 could balance the budget uh, on spending uh, g- given the level of revenues that that we have these days i mean it what this says is maybe we haven't reached the absolute bottom maybe we could go back to 2004 and 2005 and maybe we could achieve that but that but but the point is that still doesn't balance the budget because of the revenue drop over the period of time and you would have to sustain that even if you got there you would have to sustain that over a, a prolonged period of time in order to you know in order to at least you know limit the fiscal gap and we've never done that in, in the state's history we've never done that well i think what this shows us more than anything else is that we've been living on the gravy train for far too long i mean really because we've ex- we've had this expectation of high revenues we've lived in the high revenue curve for so long we just can't fathom it without the high revenues and people are not willing to face the fact that those revenues are not going to be there anymore i mean that's right. that's kind of the bottom line right and now the question is who and now and now we sort of transition in well the question is who pays since we can't since, since we can't hold it down who pays and the answer has been for the last five years, the middle and lower income Alaska families pay through well, through through a, a revenue mechanism that has the largest adverse impact on them and the largest adverse impact on the overall. Well, and I and I, I agree with you. That's been the reaction, but I think I think the I think it's the wrong question. Not who pays. I think the question should be. I mean, in my mind, in a perfect world, if I was emperor for a day, the question should be: What do we got that we don't need? That should be the question. Instead of who pays for all this overbloated stuff that we've built up using revenues that we've had for years and these high revenue streams that we keep expecting to come back, which are not going to come back, the question instead of who pays for it, the question should be what can we live without? But that's just not a question that anybody in the government is willing to ask. I mean, there are individuals, but collectively as a group, nobody's willing to ask the question of what are we willing to live without? What do we have that we don't really need because the revenues aren't coming and we can't burden the economy with more taxation on top of everything else that's going on? But nobody is asking that question. Well, um, no. <laughs> and, and they don't have anything to point to. I mean, what this chart really tells you is they don't have a lot to point to to say, but we, we've done without this before. I mean, what this really says is we've never done without since 1993 we've never or 19, 1973 we've never done without uh uh at, at the spending uh, at these sorts of at, at these sorts of levels so i mean yes you can say what can we live without but there's no historical comparison there's no historical time you can look to and say that we lived without this well i guess i would like to go back before 1973 what was that first that we got that first tranche of 900 million dollars and it was what uh we the the state budget at the time was something like 163 or 164 million dollars for the whole state and that's right go yeah yeah, governor governor egan controlled paper clips he wouldn't even give you a paper clip yeah Uh, well, Willie Hensley's got a great story on that. It's, uh, yes, it was a very, it was a very, very different time. Uh, very few Alaskans are still around who were here in 1973 and re- and remember those times. Um, the state since that time, the state just hasn't hasn't had that sort of mentality. Yeah, no, and it's and and I think unfortunately that's unfortunate. I think we need to return to that mentality because I think that's I think that's where our revenues are driving us. I think the idea that we're going to be able to Put all this on the back of Alaskans and continue to uh, uh, to push on it is just is just crazy. Uh, Brad Keithley, uh, final uh, final thought here. Twenty seconds. Well, every every year that we say we need to go, we need to we need to go back to you know some period of time, or we need to go back to 1973 and, and start rationing paper clips again. Every year that we say that and it doesn't happen, we're leaving the PFD as the only as the only revenue source. We're just leaving. Yep. Uh, 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 tax cuts uh, or, or taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families is the only revenue source. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.